ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to Cybus and welcome to London. This is our first hosted Cybus in London. And we have certainly picked an interesting time to be here. We are thrilled to have over 11,000 bankers and technologists gathered from more than 150 countries and with over 200 exhibitors and 100 fintechs. And as you know, our theme this year is thriving in a hyper-connected world. So as is our tradition at the opening plenary, we welcome our distinguished speaker, and then the chairman and the CEO give their annual addresses to the community. So it is my great distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our first speaker to the Saiba stage, Minou Shafiq, director of the London School of Economics and Political Science. An economist by training, Manoush has an extensive career that spans the world of public policy and academia, the World Bank, the IMF, and the UK's Department of International Development, and Deputy Governor of the Bank of England in 2014. She was appointed as Director of the LSC in September 2017. Manoush will share her thoughts with us in a conversation with Rula Khalaf, Deputy Editor of the Financial Times. Rula and Minush, welcome to Cybos. The stage is yours. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a hyper-connected world, <laughs> but also welcome to a very uncertain world. What Minush and I are going to try to do this morning is to give you the global context. So Minoush, let me start with the economy. As you know, the OECD last week downgraded quite significantly the world economic outlook uh, to 2.9% this year, 3% next year. And for a while, we weren't sure about the impact of the trade war, but this downgrade was directly related to the impact of the, of the trade war. So, my first question to you is, how worried should we be? Mm. I, it, is, it is now clear that the trade war is behind the slowdown. And I think, uh, I think we should be worried. I think we should be worried uh, because, the, you know, I would start by saying trade actually had started to slow down before the trade war started. We had a massive increase in global trade as China was being integrated into the global economy. So for many decades, the growth of trade was faster than the growth rate of GDP. That changed uh, a few years ago, before the trade war started, because China had been absorbed into global supply chains and had been integrated in the world economy. So there already had been a bit of a slowdown. But the more recent slowdown is really driven by the fear of the rise of protectionism. And that the reason I think we need to be worried is not just because of the direct impacts of growing protectionism, but because it's symptomatic of a, a view about the global economy and the adherence to a rules-based international system which has delivered so much prosperity in recent decades. I'd like to get to what monetary policy and fiscal policy can do about this. But before that, um, just talking about the trade war, it seems to me that even if we get a trade deal between the US and China, and the talks have, have now, uh, they seem to be back on track. Mm. The Washington consensus now is one of confrontation mm. with China. And this goes way beyond the administration. Yeah. And I think the hardening of attitude is, goes even beyond the US. How do we get to a situation where we create rules of engagement with, with China and avoid a Cold War? Yes, I agree with you. I think, um, you know, for a very long time, China, I often said, rode two horses. Um, they were developing their own systems and approaches, but they were still very keen to engage in the multilateral system. I used to be at the IMF and sat through endless meetings where we argued about how big a voice, how big a share China should have in 
the Bretton Woods institutions in the IMF and the World Bank. And I think the world was too slow in accommodating China and giving it a voice that was proportionate to the size of its economy. And because we were too slow, China then proceeded to set up its own institutions. And we've seen that now. And so institutions like the Asian Infrastructure Bank, the Belt and Road Initiative, the huge increase in swap lines that the central bank in China has now with over 30 countries as they try and create an RMB-based trading system. All of those are symptoms of the fact that China felt like it wouldn't get a fair deal in the existing international system, so they were going to create a parallel one. And I think the recent hardening of positions in Washington has meant that we risk that them, rather than riding two horses, they may switch to their own horse. Um, and I think, I would like to think that we could avoid that. I would like to think that, uh, you know, cooler heads will prevail in terms of the wider interests. Organizations like SWIFT are hugely dependent on interconnections and free flow of information, finance, trade. But if we fail, we will have to think a lot about how to build pipes between two parallel economic systems and spheres of influence, which will be much less efficient. The case of Huawei, in a way, showed us the risks of, of decoupling. But what I'm trying to get to is what needs to be done on both sides to get to some kind of understanding. I don't think we will be able to get multiple deals, uh, but perhaps some kind of an understanding. Yes. I mean, I think um, there are a set of issues around intellectual property, which there has actually been some progress m made in the trade negotiations on intellectual property. I think it's eased by the fact that China has become a producer of intellectual property itself and has technological innovations, huge increase in, t in patents by Chinese companies, universities, and the government. And so I actually am fairly optimistic on the intellectual property side that there will be an emerging understanding. And I think that the trickier issues are around the structure of China, China's economy and the role of state-owned enterprises and the pace at which China liberalizes those aspects of the economy because that goes to the heart of the economic system and particularly to employment and whether those workers will be protected or not. And I think that's the much trickier part of finding an understanding. Moving on to monetary policy. Uh, Mario Draghi last week, according to some, did more than it takes, not whatever it takes. And there was quite a bit of a backlash, particularly in Germany. Yeah. Do you think he made the right decision? Well, I think the ECB is facing a situation where they've been below their inflation target now for years. Uh, so I think, you know, they, he, he acted within his mandate, which was to try and deliver a, an inflation target, which was near 2%. Um, I do think that, he, you know, he did what he had to do, but I do think that he also has been calling for a shift in the balance of policy toward fiscal policy. I think Christine Lagarde, when in her testimony to the European Parliament, said, I'm not a fairy. I can't sprinkle some magic and create growth. And monetary policy, as we know, simply creates demand. It does not solve the supply side and the growth side of the economy. And really, there is a need for more fiscal activism in Europe, but also in other countries. How much room is there for fiscal activism in Europe? Yeah. I mean, it is true that debt levels are high post the financial crisis. Most countries in Europe have debt levels which are in the order of, you know, somewhere between 60 to 100% of GDP, with Italy being the major outlier in terms of its, uh, its debt levels. There has been a sort of um, new fashion called uh, the, new monetary, uh, the new monetary theory, which argues that as long as your growth rate is higher than your interest rate, you can keep borrowing. And that is true from, you know, num numerically that is true as long as your growth rate is higher than your interest rate. 
Uh, and that argument has been used to, to make the case for why even highly indebted countries in Europe can afford to borrow more. But of course, you have to be prudent, because at some point, the interest rate may be higher than your growth rate, in which case your debt becomes unsustainable. Um, so I think there is room to borrow. I think it's vital that the borrowing that's done creates new productive capacity, is in investing in things like infrastructure and skills, so that the productivity and investment opportunities in those economies increases over time. And if there's more borrowing for that purpose, I think markets would see that as credible. Do you think that the world of low interest rate is now the new normal? I think it's going to be the new normal for quite a while. Um, you know, the reason interest rates are very low is, is simply because savings exceed the amount of investment opportunities there are out there. And savings are very high because populations are aging, and that is a long-term demographic trend. What, one can, what can change is the investment opportunities out there. And governments have the tools to alter that, as do the fact that new emerging markets are becoming increasingly attractive with higher investment returns. And so I think the only prospect for interest rates going up are in terms of changing the dynamics of investment opportunities in the global economy. And I think we're, we're going to be discussing some ways of, of changing these dynamics. But looking at the Fed, um, Jay Powell also came under some criticism, although he did not move as, as, as far as the, the ECB. Um, and he is, of course, under pressure from, uh, from the president. How worried should we be about the independence of central banks? Because this isn't just in the US, we've seen also pressure in India, we've seen pressure, long lasting pressure in Turkey. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I think it's a very tough time to be a central banker. Um, I think the reasons differ. Uh, in the advanced economies, it's a tough time to be a central banker because Partly because in the wake of the crisis, central banks took extraordinary measures, which I think were required in order to avoid a Great Depression in the wake of the financial crisis. But as a result of that, the quantitative easing grew their balance sheets enormously, increased asset prices, and just made central bank policy much more visible and more politically contentious. And so I think in the advanced economies, that is the challenge, and that's why independence is being challenged. In the emerging markets like Turkey, like India, it's essentially a fiscal problem. Governments want to spend more and they want lower interest rates and they want central banks to deliver lower interest rates so they can spend more. Um, and that's a much more old fashioned problem, uh, but, uh, but very real at the moment. So you said um, that it's, it's a tough time to be a central banker and yet, at least according to the FT, uh, you may be a central banker again. So are you, I just think it's important for this audience to hear it from you. Uh, you are in the running for the Bank of England. I have a very nice job at the moment, which I'm enjoying immensely. <laughs> That's a very polite answer. <laughs> Uh, but speaking of um, the Bank of England, because I would like to uh, pivot to Brexit as well. I mean, that we cannot have a conversation in London without talking about Brexit, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, the Bank of England held fire um, last week, and it has been adopting more of a wait and see approach. You think that's the right approach, given the uncertainty? I mean, Inflation is not that far from where it is supposed to be. Uh, I think there is huge uncertainty as to the nature of the relationship with Europe uh, and what potential trade deal will be had. I think it was. I think it's prudent to wait and see. I'm not going to ask you to predict what's going to happen with Brexit, uh, <laughs> because at least to me it feels like Groundhog Day uh, every day. But. I do think that we have to start thinking about the structure of the British economy post-Brexit, whether it's a soft Brexit, whether it's a no-deal Brexit, things will have to change. Yeah. Do you think that it's inevitable that um, the UK will become a more low-tax, low-regulation state? 
I don't think it's inevitable. I think it's a policy choice, and I think it will depend hugely on what kind of government we have at the time. You know, the UK economy is 80% services. I think that's likely to remain the case. I think there were some people who thought with sterling uh, at a much lower value that we would have a resurgence of manufacturing in the UK. That has never happened historically. It has not happened yet. I think the nature of manufacturing is also changing in the world because of automation and that global supply chains are shifting because of that. Uh, you may see some reshoring of manufacturing. You know, I recently visited a, a, a chemical plant, a huge chemical plant that was being run by one guy with six computer screens because it was really more or less fully automated. Uh, and so suddenly low wages are no longer the key determinant for firms' location decisions. So that may change a little bit at the margin, but I think in the end, the UK is gonna be a knowledge-based economy based primarily in services. And those services will probably widen as a result uh, of some of these economic changes. I think Brexit per se may affect the destination, depending on the nature of the relationship with Europe, the destination of those service exports. Uh, and if there's a less favorable trade deal with Europe, some of those exports may shift to other markets. Uh, but I think the structure of the economy uh, will not change fundamentally from what it is today. Does that mean that there are opportunities as well as major risks in, in Brexit? Where specifically might we see the opportunities? Well, I think a, it is so hard to say without knowing what the trade relationship will be with Europe and with the rest of the world. Um, what we do know is that trade deals take a great deal of time, uh, and I suspect that until that time passes, many firms may become more domestically focused until those trade deals are, are, uh, are agreed. Um, that that's, may not a, that's an interesting point, that a lot of firms may have to focus on the domestic market more. That would be my, you know, given the long lags in, or in, in negotiating trade deals, if you didn't have good trading relationships, a, 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 trade deal, a good trade deal with the, with the EU, and by the time you get others in place, I think that, will, that is a possible consequence. When it comes to universities, this has been a, a great success story, export success story for, yes. for the UK. Yes. Um, it is entirely possible that we will get far fewer European students. Uh, there's a lot of EU research money that comes into the UK. Mm. What, what worries you the most? And how is the LSE, for example, preparing? And how, what lessons can, can we draw? Yeah. So I think if you look at the UK university sector as a whole, there has been a decline in applicants from Europe, students. We have not seen that at the LSE. We've actually seen an increase from, in applicants from Europe. I think we're a little bit distinct because we have a global brand and we're a little bit sheltered from some of this. But in the, on the whole, you have seen a decline in, in student numbers. I think the recent announcement on post-study work visas, which will allow graduates from UK universities to work in the UK for two years to get experience, will actually help quite a lot in terms of attracting more international students. But the thing I'm most worried about is what you, what you indicated, which is the collaborative research that we do with Europe. So if you look at what the most widely cited research is in the world, it tends to be research that is a product of international collaborations. Uh, and the best quality research comes from that. And it is vital for UK universities to stay connected to the European Research Network. And creating a UK alternative is not enough. I heard a wonderful example from the head of the Swiss universities. The Swiss universities uh, fell out of the European research system for two years, ironically because of a referendum. Uh, and the Swiss government created its own pot of money to try and replicate the European pot of money to fund research at Swiss universities. And the head of the Swiss University Federation said to me, you know, it was a bit like telling Roger Federer 
that you can't play in Wimbledon anymore, but we're going to create our own little international tennis tournament in Lausanne, and the prize money will be the same, and you can just play there. Of course, that's not the same. If you're going to be globally competitive, you want to compete on a global stage. Uh, so I think that is the most important thing, that UK universities have to remain connected to and a part of the European research network in order to stay uh, globally competitive. You wrote in, in the FT earlier this year um, that populists have a point. That was the headline of, of your piece. Um, and I quote what you said, to ward off the populist threat, we cannot pretend that the old system was fine. We must address the legitimate, legitimate grievances populists identified. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Because br Brexit is part of the same trend. Absolutely. So if you look at what's happened to income distribution around the world over the last 20 years, there's a very clear pattern. The people whose incomes have grown the most are two groups, the top 1% and the middle class in the emerging markets. The group who's experienced the worst income growth is the middle class in the advanced economies. And so it's not a surprise that those groups have been very disgruntled. And there are many dimensions to responding to that disgruntlement. People talk about groups who've been left behind. I think some of them would say, well, they were never given a chance. They live in part, it, there's a very strong geographical element. There's a, there's a sense in, there are many, there are many parts of the country in the UK, but also in other countries where populism is rising, where there's been very little investment in infrastructure, in, in jobs, and the opportunities that those people have had have been very, very few. Education is a key part of the story. Um, you know, there's a very close correlation between low levels of education and people who vote for populist parties, not because they're not intelligent, but because they know that the current set of policies are strongly in favor of those who have education. And if you haven't got an education, your economic prospects are poor. And so responding with education is a key part of, uh, of that story. Education, infrastructure to parts of the country that haven't ha been given an opportunity. But that also brings me to the whole issue of capitalism and the reform of capitalism. Uh, we've just launched at the FT a, a new brand campaign, so this is very much on our mind and we have a, a series um, coming out uh, about this. But the business roundtable mm -hmm. in, in the US, which is made up 200 uh, CEOs, recently issued a statement uh, about stakeholder capitalism, saying essentially that share, shareholder maximizing profits cannot be the only and the primary purpose of a corporation. Do you think that in this response to, capital, to uh, populism, mm. there has to be a reset, a reform? I do think there has to be a reset. Um, and I think this is a welcome debate, that corporations are thinking about wider stakeholders, employees, communities they work, they operate in. But I also think that voluntary approaches by corporations are not enough. I think it's great that there are enlightened leaders of corporations who are showing the way, and I welcome that and applaud that. But I think in the end, if you want to have a consistent approach across an economy, you will need changes in the rules and changes in the laws. Uh, because it's very easy when being socially and environmentally responsible moves you in the same direction as uh, shareholder value. So for example, you'll hear lots of very you know, forward-thinking corporate leaders saying, I'm gonna have really good environmental and social policies because it helps me recruit millennials and I get much better talent if they know they're working in an, in an organization that has social purpose. Well, that's pretty consistent with shareholder value because it's linked to the, my talent strategy. So that's, that's relatively easy. I think the tricky part comes when, say, I have to change my energy mix more quickly than might be financially optimal for environmental reasons, 
or I have to invest more in retraining workers when I am restructuring my company rather than simply laying them off, which might be much, much cheaper. I think in order to make that happen, there will have to be changes in the rules of the game. Uh, so I welcome the, the debate. The question is how far it goes before it, you stifle capitalism, because I mean, you, you, you do need to strike a very delicate balance there. You do, you do. And of course, there is another way of doing it, which is to say, okay, fine, you do shareholder value, but I'm gonna tax you a lot more in order to pay for the retraining. And I think that that may actually make sense in many countries. If you, sorry about that. If you think about what's happened to labor markets, most workers today are much less attached to their employers. If you go on LinkedIn, the average number of jobs on a CV has gone up every year. And so it's legitimate to ask, does it make sense for employers to invest in workers who are gonna turn over very quickly? Maybe there is another solution, which might be an industry-wide solution, or maybe a public sector solution, and that firms would pay in, and the government would then invest in retraining those workers to make sure that they have a future. So, so I think these are exactly the kind of questions we need to be asking as to how far you can push the, the stakeholder approach. You mentioned um, retraining. Are you a pessimist or an optimist when it comes to uh, AI and jobs? Yeah. So I definitely think artificial intelligence and automation will change most jobs. At least half of jobs will be changed in a fundamental way over the next 10 or 20 years because of AI. But I'm an optimist because I don't think jobs are gonna disappear. I don't buy this, suddenly we're all going to be unemployed and we all need to have a universal basic income to survive because we won't have any jobs to do. I don't buy that. Jobs will change. I think what's different about the AI revolution is that we're used to thinking about manufacturing jobs changing, that workers are replaced by machines. The AI, re AI revolution will change jobs that we don't normally think of being prone to automation. Accountants, lawyers, doctors, those kind of professional jobs, which increasingly parts of will be automated. So for example, diagnostic tools. There are now incredible diagnostic tools which can diagnose, say, eye diseases better than any doctor can. So increasingly, our diagnostic treatment will be done by a machine but you'll still want to talk to a doctor about your treatment plan, and the doctor will have to develop a different set of skills which complement what the machine does. And so I think we need to think about what roles will complement what can be automated uh, and, and develop those skills in the next generation. And we need to invest much, much more than we're investing. I'm, this is a bit of a hobby horse for me, but if you look at countries that have been successful in looking after employees during this digital revolution, there are countries like Denmark who spend 1.7% of GDP, which is a very big number, on what they call active labor market policies, preparing the workforce for the jobs of the future. Countries like the UK, countries like the US spend less than a fraction of 1% to 2% of that, of, of what the Danes spend. And so I think that's also a key part of the solution. So with a call to investment, we have to wrap uh, this up. Thank you so much, Minush for Thank being with us. Thank you, Lola. Thank you all very much as well. Minush and Rula, thank you very much for those extremely relevant and absolutely brilliant remarks. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is an absolutely fantastic time to be a professional in the financial services arena. So as is my tradition, I'm going to cover three topics today. One, the payments and securities industry is going through unprecedented change. We are seeing heightened business interest and increasing market valuation drive for speed, transparency, and efficiency, and ease of use, and new non-bank entrants, like Facebook's Libra, and others that are fundamentally changing the competitive landscape. 
two. SWIFT is your bank-owned at FinTech. We have a proven track record of both bank enablement and innovation. SWIFT will continue to accelerate all these developments for the capability of the industry. And of course, that is in the areas of payments, securities, and financial crime compliance. SWIFT's vision will be even more bolder and its business agenda even more aggressive. We will enable and focus on doing this across the entire financial services industry while innovating with a coalition of the willing. So three, what will not change is SWIFT's focus on its true north, serving the banking industry as a bank-owned, globally neutral cooperative with an extreme focus on resiliency, integrity, reliability, and security, fully respecting its oversight from the G10 central banks. Now, let us double click on all three. Let's start with the business of payments. Using a few slides sourced from McKinsey, I'm gonna do this very fast. A, cross-border payments are still showing healthy growth. B, Cross-border payment flows and revenues are mainly concentrated in the business-to-business -business segment. These charts show both volumes and revenues. C, payments have clearly outperformed other parts of the financial services industry. Not only is the growth in shareholder, shareholder returns higher, but so are the multiples. Now, what happens when that happens? D. Recent M&A is unprecedented with deals we would not have imagined in the past. And E, the industry is undergoing an extraordinary change, not only with technology and M&A, but with those entrants I referred to, like Facebook's Libra and the, emergency, uh, sorry, and the emergence of crypto assets. So, but let me pause for a second. There is a but here. This change should not make us lose sight of the real work needed to safeguard risk and compliance, ensure absolute integrity and resilience, and to provide efficiencies. It is my view that with all this excitement, anyone, anyone who ignores the fundamentals of this does so at their peril. Allow me to also briefly cover security servicing businesses, this time with a few slides sourced from BCG. So A, the security servicing businesses remains valuable to banks. They continue to offer attractive returns on equity and capital. B, on the technology side, the industry continues to spend mostly on driving cost efficiencies with some focus on innovation. But here's the fun part on C. In this industry, fintechs have proven to be partners rather than competitors. Okay, so now let's switch gears and talk about your cooperative. Our scale is unmatched, bringing together a global community of over 200 countries 11,000 banks and corporates, in addition to 250 payments and securities market infrastructures, along with, of course, central banks. We combine deep expertise in our core years, and again, payments, securities, financial crime compliance. And as you know, securities is 50% plus of our traffic and growing very rapidly. I am proud to tell you that your cooperative is in excellent shape. We finished 2018 with message traffic, our key measure, at an all-time high, double-digit growth and strong operational performance. Our number one priority remains supporting the integrity, stability of the global financial system. So in particular, though, I'd like to highlight three accomplishments. The acceleration of GPI, 
the continued rollout and adoption of our customer security program and developments in SWIFT's financial compliance offering. So, one thing I want to emphasize though, these accomplishments are not just SWIFT's. They are your accomplishments for the entire SWIFT community. So take GPI, a major priority. Javier will tell us a lot more about the latest and what lies ahead. What I want to emphasize, that in our labs, we are experimenting with all kinds of technologies, DLT, AI, cloud, machine learning, to best understand how to leverage this potential for you. We are harmonizing and leveraging APIs to enhance integration of new technologies and new services as they emerge. We're working to increase payments predictability and developing pre-validation to remove the most common cause of processing delays and rejection. Remember, we now view payments as something that should be done end to end in seconds. So now let's talk about the customer security program. You're very well aware of this program, a framework of protect, detect, and recover. For those interested in learning more, there are multiple streams at Cybos delivered by absolutely world-class practitioners. Swift continues to make significant investments on this on your behalf. Third area, financial crime compliance. We continue to accelerate and innovate. The KYC registry, sanction screening service, compliance analytic tools. So, I've talked about GPI, customer security program, financial crime compliance. These enable speed, cost, ease of use with security, reliability, and compliance, an integral part of SWIFT. But let me emphasize, these are all assets that we are going to integrate and leverage further. So now allow me to spend a few minutes about SWIFT's vision to emphasize these three points. Number one, SWIFT will on your behalf be even bolder, accelerating not only its strategic scope, but also its speed of execution. Two, we will make it very, we will work very, very hard actually to make it easier for all banks worldwide to implement these mandatory initiatives like GPI, ISO, CSP, et cetera. And an important end, SWIFT will accelerate on this, working very closely with the global transaction banks, especially those that have an industry-centric open global vision as part of the coalition of the willing. Okay, three, let's discuss what will not change. And what will not change is SWIFT's true north. A bank-owned fintech, which is focused on enabling the banks so that they are the ones creating value for their end customers. SWIFT does not optimize its own independent valuation but rather those of the shareholders of the payments and securities businesses of its owner banks. We will continue to be relentlessly focused on security, reliability, resilience, and integrity. And our mission continues to be globally neutral. And as you know, SWIFT is overseen by the G10 central banks and fully respects is this active and rigorous oversight as a critical element of our core. SWIFT's governance is also a reflection of our true north. With highly capable and experienced banking and financial services executives, with skill sets ranging from payments, securities, technology, risk, and operations, board members from large global banks and smaller banks from the US, Canada, UK, Japan, 
Russia, China, and elsewhere. And a management team that is strong, continues to be absolutely active and very well led. In fact, this is a good opportunity to share with the community our recent CEO selection process. So as you can well imagine, this was all planned out in terms of both timing and process. Swift used a world-class firm to search and review candidates internally and externally. Swift was looking for a CEO who was a true global citizen with a strong track record of leadership and execution. We wanted someone who would continue to accelerate the momentum. Well, you all know the answer. Our internal candidate, Javier, was selected unanimously by the full board after a fairly intense and disciplined selection process. He understands and lives our true north. And you will hear from him very shortly. So allow me to conclude by thanking the SWIFT board for its active governance, thanking the national groups for their enthusiastic engagement, and thanking the entire SWIFT community for their active support. Also, your SWIFT management team and employees are dedicated, hardworking, relentless on serving you, the community. And I want to thank them on behalf of myself and the full board. I remain truly honored to serve you as SWIFT's chairman on behalf of the entire community. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome SWIFT CEO Javier to the stage. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Yawar, for those kind words of introduction. Well, it's great to be here in London, uh, a city I've got to know very well, especially as I've led the business here over the past four years. I have to say, it's a great place to work. I wouldn't necessarily trade the weather with Spain, but I'm beginning to appreciate the refreshing rain showers. Well, we've got lucky so far, but I think they're on the way. Uh, so well, but speaking seriously, uh, it's a privilege to have the trust of the chairman and the board and I'm very fortunate to step into the role with SWIFT in great shape, thanks to the excellent record of my predecessor, Gottfried. For me personally, I've been 24 years in the company, and I don't think there's ever been a better time to work for SWIFT. We have an extremely resilient core, and at the same time, huge opportunities to innovate to ultimately allow you to grow market share. And as Yawara mentioned, as a society, our use of technology continues to evolve at a rapid pace. Taking another few examples, this is, a, this is a good one from the skincare industry. Now 3D imaging, now driving shopping habits. And that's a pretty good one as well. It's a startup who converts plastic bottles into winter jackets, bringing essentially innovation and sustainability together. And maybe, after receiving uh, your USB backpack in Sydney last year, this week you brought your smart luggage with you to help you stay constantly connected. Well, we heard it. The Cybos team is all about doing business in a hyper-connected world, after all. And of course, in our industry, as global payments and securities markets continue to grow, rapid shifts in technology are creating massive change, and big dollar investments, particularly in transaction banking and cross-border payments. That opens up many new ways to provide banking services, whether that's via big tech platforms like Alipay, fintech new entrants, 
driven by open banking, and or global card players that are expanding beyond retail and into business segments. Well, I, I'm sure many of you have some of these apps on your phones today. Actually, uh, for financial institutions, there are dynamics of both collaboration and competition, creating a healthy tension to offer the most compelling customer channels, the best client experience, and execute payments faster than ever before. So this big acceleration in the front end means that the underlying infrastructure that sits behind have to become more agile and increasingly more interconnected with this growing number of apps and customer channels. And yet, crucially, these infrastructures also have to remain just as reliable. So when I think about SWIFT in this context, so it is our job to offer the industry a best-in-class platform. This is what we're known for. So that you can rely on us and focus on the front end, on acquiring new customers and growing share through new services. But at the same time, we could, we could say that we have become essentially a two-sided platform for the financial industry long before anyone was talking about platform economics or Google or Amazon. Actually, actually our, our model of connecting providers and users at scale is fairly similar. And like these tech players, we need to focus heavily on innovation to keep that scale and relevance. And I think there is no doubt that we have been innovating. And GPI is a perfect case in point. Today with GPI, more than half of all international payments now reach end beneficiary customers within minutes. And as real time becomes the industry standard for domestic payments, I'm convinced that we can also take that ambition to the cross-border space. This week, for example, we're launching GPI Instant that will hook up GPI with real-time payment systems. And of course, with banks playing a front and center role. We've done some uh, trials with payments moving across continents, account to account, in just a few seconds. So yes, international payments in seconds. But we are not going to stop there. Our vision is to become an instant global network for cross-border transactions, which means creating an even more efficient and interconnected payment system that enables our users to transact from account to account anywhere in the world in an instant. And across all the world's currencies, with full transparency of fees and FX rates. So, yeah, instant, frictionless, and as seamless as domestic payments. That is what we're working towards. And with uh, actually GPI tracking, we are also now helping the industry to reduce settlement risk and improve liquidity in capital markets. But I have to say, that while innovation and speed are important, there is also a flip side. With challenges like cyber and compliance here to stay, we need to keep our feet firmly on the ground. And so that's why, with this challenge in mind, for us at SWIFT, it's all about both innovation and risk management basically about responsible innovation. So our platform is reinforced with a major focus on cyber controls, on uh, fraud detection and prevention capabilities, on compliance tools, and data analytics. Basically, we focus on making sure that we maintain these highest levels of resilience, security, and compliance, backed up 
by very strong oversight. So the simple rails of the past have evolved into smart rails and an even more open and trusted community system that is fast, safe, and compliant. So, but uh, of course, uh, with uh, all of this puts us on the right track, but with uh, some up and downs, ups and downs on over the last 40 years in the fintech game, we have learned clear lessons along the way. Today, when we roll out something new, we check that it brings customer value, that you trust the technology that lies behind, that we support it well, and that it can scale. And that is what being a grown-up fintech is all about. So yes, as I was saying, all of that puts us on the right track, but with this explosion of choice in the market, our vision is to be the reference, not just in B2B payments, but also to help our customers, our members, reuse our platform into other services. To use an analogy, it's a bit like in many cities around the world where new restaurants start popping up. They're usually located in one trendy area, close to each other. So that customers are bombarded with new choices to go and try out. Shoreditch, uh, just on the road here in East London, is a great example. In fact, full of both fintech and restaurant startups at the same time. Actually, a great place to visit while you're here. But behind all the attractive branding and design of these new restaurants, what do we really know about the restaurant's kitchen? Does it have fresh, healthy ingredients, great hygiene standards, skill chefs, or state-of-the-art equipment? And if the dish isn't good, can you send it back? Back to Swift, and the point is, it's like we have created this great kitchen together that is adding fast and healthy new dishes that the whole industry can use to provide great services to their end clients. But with a whole array of very compelling front ends out there, we cannot expect customers themselves to be worrying about double clicking of what is happening in the back of the kitchen. But we, as a community, we should definitely double click on that. So in cross-border payments, there are many mobile apps uh, with uh, very appealing front ends uh, that have a couple of delivery options for the underlying infrastructure. It could be good to read the small print because even with the same speed of delivery, there may be differences in quality and customer service. Obviously, we don't know necessarily what lies behind them, but we do know what lies behind SWIFT. We are, an in, we are a global network for the financial community. And as Yawar mentioned, we have a proven track record of delivery. So in short, I think, I think we, we know that you, both banks and fintechs, have alternatives in the back end. But with this combination of both innovation on the one hand and robust compliance and cyber controls on the other, we are perfectly positioned to be the reference platform to help you stay ahead in the battle for the front end so that you can offer the best, best in class customer experience to, the, to your end clients. And we can make it happen by exposing our infrastructure through APIs to your apps and customer channels. And as I said, not just in our B2B traditional market, but also in e-commerce, person-to-person payments, remittances, or even potentially white labeling in some segments. So that is what energizes me as I take on the job. And as we start to define the next phase of our strategy with the community, 
in the months ahead. I've already been having positive discussions on this with several financial institutions, and I see it as a clear direction of travel. And our innovation agenda isn't just about payments, by the way. With APIs gaining strong momentum in the securities ecosystem, we are looking at how they can be a powerful enabler of change in the post-trade space as well. So there is clearly deep transformation on the way in our industry, which is an opportunity for us all. And what better place to talk transformation and gain inspiration than here at Cybos? I was thinking last week that I've been to the last 19 editions, but London will really be a special one for me. With an exciting agenda ahead of us, an enormous thank you to the team for creating such a unique event. It's great to feel part of it, and I wish you all a fantastic week ahead. Thank you. <laughs>